Let's move on to the last talk of today's session. Uh, Professor Olivia Merkel, Professor of Drug Delivery at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, will talk about microfluidic assembly of nucleic acid loaded nanoparticles. Thank you very much for the introduction, also for uh, invitation and for having me here today. We've already heard quite a bit about uh, microfluidics and we've also heard about micelles, which is great, so I don't have to give much of an introduction, especially because I'm not an, a microfluidics expert, so I guess our t my talk um, on the research of my groups is really more um, application-oriented. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about different parameters that um, we found interesting and especially the, uh, the differences between in vitro and in vivo screening. So um, when we make a nucleic acid uh, loaded nanoparticles, we can use all types of different kinds of nucleic acids. And we've already heard earlier today mm. that there are different types. And um, in, the, in the 90s, we were interested in different nucleic acids. And it seems like every um, decade, there's a, a new type of nucleic acids that becomes very hot and interesting. So um, currently, of course, everyone's interested in uh, CRISPR-Cas delivery, and so are we. But um, the main focus of my labs is really on um, siRNA delivery. So what you see in the slide is that um, the, the structure of the nucleic acids can really have a, a big impact. And especially if you try to encapsulate them in nanoparticles, it may make a difference if you have, uh, let's say, a plasmid that can be supercoiled, or you have a, a short double strand that seems very rigid and very difficult to encapsulate. And also, um, if you have longer RNA or DNA that can have a secondary structure as um, uh, uh, mRNA, for example, then um, this may also have an impact on, on encapsulation. So what we saw is that if you develop a delivery system, because obviously those nucleic acids cannot be delivered directly to cells, then it really depends on the, the secondary structure and the, the actual um, structure of, uh, of the nucleic acids that you're trying to encapsulate. So um, there's a broad range of different um, nanoparticle carriers for nucleic acids, and we've also heard a bit about this today already. Um, I will focus in my talk on, um, uh, on my cells, and uh, what we are using are not the typical um, uh, phospholipids that we've already heard about, but we use um, polymer um, block copolymers for, um, for um, nucleic acid delivery. So the, the big drawbacks in conventional nanoparticle formulation is that usually we do that on a lab scale, and we have big differences from batch to batch. So every time we make a new batch, the sizes, polydispersity, zeta potentials can be um, quite different from a previous batch. Or let's say you have a new student, and the new student suddenly has some different sizes, different uh, uh, polydispersities or zeta potentials. So if we were to be able to um, overcome this problem of batch-to-batch -batch variability, that would really help in the, the clinical translation process. Um, the other thing is that um, oftentimes with this batch-to-batch -batch variability, we see poor reproducibility, as I said before, from one student to a different one. You may see different sizes and so on. The other thing is that um, with nucleic acid nanoparticles or nanoparticles in general, there's a, a problem of physical stability. So just um, d uh, due to um, thermodynamics, um, nanoparticles are not uh, thermodynamically stable, so they tend to aggregate in sediment. So if you want to um, make a nanoparticle um, suspension that's supposed to have a certain shelf life, this can be a problem as well. As well as biological instability, if you think of nucleic acids, which, which are always prone to um, uh, being degraded over time. So there's a, um, in the clinics, there would be a need for fresh preparations every time you treat a patient, but oftentimes um, it would be difficult to tell a nurse, for example, you have to mix five microliters of this and 10 microliters of that, and then you have to dilute it to a certain volume that you will inject in the patient. So it's really important for us to come up with something that um, helps us in scalability, and um, microfluidics really is a, a great approach to this. So. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we're not experts in microfluidics, but um, we've been using it a bit, and uh, we've compared it to what we call a, a batch reaction. So usually when we make a certain batch, we just pipe it a few microliters together, and my student animated the slide here, so you can see how a polymer solution is essentially mixed with a nucleic acid solution. And um, it's mixed by turbulent mix mixing. So um, what happens is that over time, if you have a, a positively charged polymer and a negatively charged nucleic acid, they will nanoprecipitate and self-assemble. 
Whereas if you um, use microfluidics, this, uh, you, you don't have turbulent mixing, but you have laminar mixing. And the actual mixing happens um, during just diffusion in the channel. So um, this helps us in, in forming more, um, uh, more monodispersed particles and more monodispersed and reproducible formulations. So um, we've tried three different uh, microfluidic setups. We initially actually made our own chips by um, nanolithography. And um, we weren't able to make the herringbone structure that, for example, a precision and dolomite have in, in their chips. So we eventually um, uh, demoed the nano assembler, but um, decided that the dolomite chip gives, a, gives us a bit more flexibility as to where we can use our own um, pumps in the lab and we don't have to purchase the pump from the company in order to just use the chips. So all the data that you will see here is all um, done with the dolomite micromixer, but we also saw that the nano sample and the dolomite, um, we didn't find any uh, differences, any um, significant differences in our formulations. So what's the advantage of microfluidic mixing? And um, you see that if you have uh, just regular um, mixing by a turbulent mixing, you see that oftentimes the, um, there's a fast nucleation and um, uh, or it can also be a slow nucleation, but over time you see a growth of the particles, so you see aggregation. And um, in, in um, case of our particles, the problem was oftentimes that we have uh, positive charges of our polymer and then we have negative charges of our um, nucleic acids, and they uh, self-assemble in a patchy way. So you have both positive and negative charges on the surface, and then those particles tend to aggregate. Whereas if you can control the time and the um, the, the time during which the particles um, form and during which the nucleic acids and the polymers mix, you can actually have a, a more precise particle and um, those particles then don't tend to, to aggregate. The uh, materials that we use are tri-block copolymers and they're made of um, three different blocks. One is a polyethylenamine block, second one is a polycaprolactone block, which is the um, hydrophobic part, and the third one is a polyethylene glycol block. We can also attach um, targeting ligands, which I will not talk about today, but um, as you see, the, the system is quite um, versatile and we can, um, we can change it uh, to whatever needs we're trying to, um, to address. So, um, of course, you can say that PEI certainly is not a very translational polymer and that's why we're currently working on replacing the positively charged um, PEI part with more biodegradable um, polyamines, but um, this uh, type of tribalocal polymers is something that um, we've done uh, a lot of research on also in terms of in vivo circulation times. We know that um, those micelles circulate for a long time and um, we know that they have a lot of advantages um, because they have this um, hydrophobic core. You heard earlier that oftentimes um, uh, micelles are used for solubilization processes of poorly water soluble drugs, but in case of um, RNA, um, it's also very um, helpful to have this um, amphiphilic structure because it will help to not only deliver the particles across the cell membrane, but it, it helps uh, very much with um, endosomal release because oftentimes those particles get stuck in the endosome and we see that with um, those um, amphiphilic structures, we don't have this type of um, endosomal entrapment that you oftentimes see with polymeric nanoparticles in cells. So um, as we heard earlier, uh, my cells assemble due to thermodynamics. So usually with my cells, you have a pretty um, small size distribution. You have rather low PDIs. And that's the same when we simply um, self-assemble our polymers. But um, as soon as we add the nucleic acids, we don't have a, we don't have a regular my cell anymore, but we have something that we call a micelloplex. So um, you have something that you can compare to just a regular polyplex where you have simply a positively charged um, PEI or a polylysine, and you add the nucleic acids. So they self-assemble due to electric charges, electrostatic interactions. And um, those um, simple uh, polyplexes have the big disadvantage that they easily disassemble in vivo. So as soon as you inject um, polyplexes in the bloodstream, it's something that we showed about 10 years ago, they will easily disassemble, and um, you don't have the circulation times that you need, and you also, you simply don't have the stability that you need. So um, with those um, poly with those micelle plexes, we were able to overcome this. And um, but the biggest problem is really that uh, we have very large uh, polydispersities. So if we simply do the batch reactor um, reaction, we have um, polydispersity indices of about uh, 0.4. And um, that's why we see big advantages of using uh, microfluidics. We also played around a bit with uh, the flow rate, and we see that in our case, the really low flow rates help 
we can use, we can scale it up to about 50 milliliters with a chip that we have, so we can't do the parallel assembly. It takes quite a while to make such a large volume, but um, we can decrease the size very efficiently, and uh, we can also decrease the, um, the polydispersity indices, so we have um, narrower size distributions. Um, we also uh, measured um, if we can encapsulate the same amount of nucleic acids in our batch reacted in our microfluidic particles, and we see that um, as if we get a stable nanoparticle where there's no free RNA of, um, in, in the in solution left. If we um, add a poly anion that's supposed to release um, the nucleic acids from the particle, we see that from both formulations, the same amount is released at um, neutral pH, and we need to actually use an um, acidic environment to release 100% of, um, of the load. But we also see that um, no matter what reaction, batch reaction or microfluidics we use, we have the same amount of RNA encapsulated. Now in the next step, um, we wanted to look into shelf life and we stored those particles at, in the fridge or in the freezer. And um, you do see that over time, especially in the fridge, the, the PDIs do still increase. So we're certainly not at a formulation that we could um, store for a very long time. But if you compare this to a batch reacted particles that aggregate to micron sized particles, this is already a big improvement. In terms of in vitro performance, we were initially a bit um, disappointed, and that's why I'm saying that I think it is very important to um, investigate your system also in vivo, because we saw that the uptake for both particles, smaller or larger, were really the same, and we didn't see any benefits here. If we looked into um, gene knockdown in vitro, it was also the same, so really no benefit. But when we did the in vivo experiment, where um, we delivered the particles to the lung, and uh, we know that larger particles are oftentimes taken up by macrophages and cleared from the lung, the smaller particles now showed a very big um, uh, benefit. And um, that's why I'm saying that um, if you do microfluidic assembly of your particles and you don't see differences in vitro, that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have a, a benefit in an in vivo um, setup where a sedimentation doesn't play a role and uh, also where you have many other factors such as uh, the presence of, of macrophages, for example. So with this, I'd like to thank you for sticking around to the, until the last talk. And this is part of my lab in Munich. Actually, some of the work was done by some of my students in the US. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, please. I absolutely uh, think that both plays a role. So, I mean, we definitely see differences. Um, also, if we, I mean, we talked about DLS and, and DLS maybe not being a, a perfect type of measurement for those uh, rather polydisperse um, suspensions. So, um, I'm sure that if we had a, a better technique, maybe we, um, I mean, I'd hope we would get better results. But I also think that the, the problem of just a batch um, reacting mixture is that um, we also, if we use other techniques such as um, uh, AFM or SEM, we oftentimes see differences in the pole dispersity or um, the average size. Any more questions? Thanks a lot for the nice talk. One question to the um, detailed preparation. What kind of solvent do you use for the tree block polymer? And did you test different ones? We, um, they're all water soluble. So um, they, they have pretty low CMCs in fact, so they form micelles easily. And um, all of these experiments were done in 5% glucose, but we also um, use uh, uh, buffers with higher um, ionic strength. And um, we actually see more aggregation tendency in, in high ionic strength buffers. Thanks a lot for all the uh, nice talks and um, use the nice coffee break for continuing discussions. I wish you a great day. Bye.